Well, hi there, and welcome once again to In Search of Christianity, brought to you by Bible Talk. And today, and perhaps for a day or two, or a time or two, we're doing a special study. And I'm calling it a clear and present danger. And it's about the great apostasy. It's a terribly important subject, and in many ways, it's just a terrible subject. Terrible to have to deal with. Um, I'm, I'm going to start by just quoting a couple of verses that are pertinent to the study, but I'll do that in just a moment. Father, I just pray, Lord God, that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart will be pleasing to you, Lord, and, and serve your purpose here today. Lord, that nothing would come out of my mouth that you've not put in my heart. And Lord, that you would give us greater understanding and a heart open to receive your word. Eyes open to see you, Jesus. So, Lord, bless this time. Bless this time that we have and use it for your purpose in our lives. Amen. Well, these are the verses I want to read as a kind of a preface. You know, the Apostle Paul wrote to the church in Corinth, 1 Corinthians 5, verses 9 through 13, and he said, I wrote to you, in my letter not to associate with immoral people. I did not at all mean with immoral people of this world or with the covetous and swindlers or with idolaters, for then you would have to go out of the world. But actually I wrote to you not to associate with any so-called brother if he is an immoral person or covetous or an idolater or a reviler or a drunkard or a swindler, not even to eat with such a one. For what have I to do with judging outsiders? Do you not judge? Do you not judge those who are within the church? But those who are outside, God judges. Remove the wicked man from among yourselves. The clear and present danger comes from within and from without. And that's what we're going to be looking at. I believe that these are the perilous last days. And I also believe in the word of God. Okay? Uh, I feel certain that many people seeing this will judge me, partially, right, because of the things said in this message. And that does not trouble me a bit. It doesn't trouble me at all because, as you should, you should judge me, as long as you do it scripturally, doing it properly, right? We believers are commanded to, listen, this is from 1 John 4, verses 1 to 3. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come into the, in the flesh is from God, and every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, of which you have heard that it is coming, and now it is already in the world. They don't confess Jesus Christ as Lord. So test me. I've said this, I don't know how many times in the studies that we've done for over 40 years. Don't take my word for it. Test me. Don't trust me. Test me. Now to set, to set the stage for this, I have to put this in context, so I think I think it's important. I want to just tell you a little bit about my, my life and background, all right? Because it's very relevant to what I'm going to speak, and it'll give you a, an idea of where I'm coming from other than just reading Scripture, right? Um, my life has been filled with miracles since the time I was born. You know, you ever hear, I, I, I'm going to share testimonies with you right from the beginning, from the very beginning I was born because I almost wasn't. I was born in 1943, and at that time, abortions, unlike today, were very, very rarely done, and only when a mother's life was in danger. My mother's life was in danger, and the doctors that were at the French hospital in Manhattan in New York City did not want to deliver me. They wanted to abort me. My father literally took my mother to a different place, went to a different hospital up in New Rochelle, New York, and obviously I'm here. And my mother is here, too. I had polio when I was a, a young child, like eight years old. And that was a time when there was 
uh, just an incredible epidemic of polio here in the United States, and children were dying all over from it. And I was, my, my parents were told that if I lived, I probably, there was a good chance I would never walk again. Well, obviously, I'm, I'm, I'm walking. My mother went and prayed, and I got out of the bed. Uh, I'm, I don't want to go through it all, but I, I just, I do want to tell you that, I mean, God's hand has obviously been upon my life since the beginning. Now, I may not have recognized that at the time, but I certainly came to recognize it. I was raised, I was born into a Catholic family, and I was raised as a Catholic. That means, you know, as an infant, I was baptized into the Catholic Church. Uh, I went, my education all through my young life was in the Catholic Church. I went to Catholic grammar school, Catholic uh, high school, a college prep uh, boys school. I was inundated with uh, the Baltimore Catechism. I don't know if you ever heard of the Baltimore Catechism, which was a teaching on the, the doctrines and teachings of the Catholic Church. Not, not on scripture, but on the teachings of the Catholic Church. Well, in 19, I might, well, I'll just say on my 33rd birthday, but to, to be accurate, Alice got saved a month before I did, a month before my 33rd birthday. She had gone to a Catholic charismatic prayer meeting that was going on in our city. Now, neither of us up to that point had been, I'll say, religious at all. I mean, you know, we would do the, the Easter and Christmas things, we, you know, but very rarely, we were not regular churchgoers. But I would have told you, you know, you asked me, I, I guess I am a Catholic. Uh, This is kind of, you know, it's hard for me to put this in, in its, really in its proper context because the Spirit of God touched my life many times and I recognized that and I felt that there was a call on my life, but I became very adept at ignoring that. So, but Alice went to a Catholic charismatic prayer meeting in the mid-70s and came home and started talking to me about Jesus. And I just told her I didn't want to hear that. Uh, I, I had never read a Bible up to that point in time. I, as I say, I was not I was not very religious, which in many ways is a good thing. But Alice came filled with the joy of the Lord, filled with the Spirit of God, and started talking to me. And I said, I just don't want to hear it. So Alice, being a submissive wife, a blessing in my life, she didn't keep talking to me about Jesus, but she pray over me at night. And uh, that had an effect because a month after she got saved, it was my birthday and Alice had gone out to get a birthday cake for me with her sister. And I was sitting at home, I was sitting at my dining room table having a cup of coffee. And I noticed up on the refrigerator, there was a Bible. Now, we had never had a Bible in the house, but Alice had brought one in now. And I don't know what drove me to do this, but I went over and I picked up the Bible off the refrigerator and I came back. And I said, Jesus, if you are real, I want to know. And I flipped that Bible open, just randomly flipped it open, and I looked down, and that was the moment my life changed forever and all time. It was just an incredible experience because I heard the voice of Jesus Christ speak to me when I read that verse. It was exactly what was in my heart, and he knew that. That changed everything. I mean, absolutely everything. At the time, I was the president of a small advertising agency in New York, and within a few months, I had transferred all my clients to, to other agencies and contacted all, contacted all my clients, contacted all of our vendors and the people that supplied our material. And I went off to pray. Alice and I left and we went off to pray because God told me that he had a purpose in my life. He was going to use my life. So that was pretty dramatic. It was, at least it was pretty dramatic for me. Um, we became very involved at that time in the Catholic charismatic movement. Now in the area we lived in, in New York, other than small black Pentecostal churches, there were no such thing as spirit-filled churches. Or oh, they were all, I mean, it was a very, very powerful mainline area. You know, the Catholic church, the Anglican church, the Presbyterian church, the Lutheran church. Uh, so we didn't really fit into anything, but we went to these Catholic charismatic prayer meetings. And as I say, God had touched my heart. I, I devoured the word. I mean, I just, I absolutely devoured the word. 
And it seemed like almost instantly I had, I'll just say, a, a better understanding or knowledge of the word than many of the people that were there. And one thing led to another. But one of the things that I noticed, and this is, this is key to what we're going to talk about today. As soon as I started to read the Bible, I recognized the fact that the things that I had been taught in the Catholic Church were in contrast to the things that I was now reading and seeing in Scripture. So many of the things. And I, I, I consider myself a fairly educated person and a, a logical person, and I could not... I could not come to grips with the fact that I was reading the scripture and the scripture said this and the teaching of the Catholic Church said something contrary to it. So I went to a Catholic priest in the, in the city that we were in and I asked him, you know, what, what's going on? Can you explain this to me? And very quickly he realized, you know, he couldn't explain it. Yeah. So I went to the next level, which is a Monsignor. And I'm from the Monsignor. He, I got the same thing there. So finally I went to a bishop. And I said, can you explain to me why, when the scripture says this, we're doing this? And he was unable to also, and basically was very short with me and just said, you know, well, it's, you just have to accept it in faith. Well, God opened a door for me. And I went to a Catholic seminary and did graduate work, some graduate work in a Catholic seminary. And my purpose in going was to find out what the Catholic Church actually believed. Because at that point, I was in a lot of confusion, didn't understand it. And I was finding it, I, I was going to say, very difficult. I, it was almost impossible for me to get answers to the questions that were rising up as I was reading Scripture. So I went to the seminary. And uh, very quickly, now I, I was blessed. I was studying, I studied Old Testament Scriptures. I was studying sacramental theology. And uh, nothing, nothing that I learned there eased the pain of not knowing because it became more and more evident that what I believed didn't line up what, you know, what I was believing from Scripture was not lining up with the, the teaching of the Catholic Church. So not long after, I mean, I, I left there and I'd started a ministry. I just went out and started sharing the gospel then on the streets of New York City in the Times Square area, the old Times Square area, before it was cleaned up at all. And I started a Bible study in our house, and that Bible study in our house, I mean, just, it was, it was a different time. I, and it, it was quite amazing because the number of people that were coming just kept growing and growing and growing until we had a house that was packed with people. Um, and that, that little, that Bible study group became a fellowship. Some might call it a church. I think God would call it a church. And that was the beginning of that part of the ministry that over 40 years ago. Uh, and, and the problem was that I couldn't reconcile the traditions of the Catholic Church with the faith that I was getting from reading the Bible. I couldn't find a priest or, or any Catholic teacher that could reconcile that. So... I didn't decide to leave the Catholic Church. I just recognized that I was no longer a part of the Catholic Church. Even though God had us in contact with them through the Catholic Charismatic Movement for a few years after that. The problem was, you know, Jesus said in the Gospel of Mark, in the seventh chapter, he said, but in vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the precepts of men, neglecting the commandment of God you hold to the tradition of men. He was also saying to them, you're experts at setting aside the commandment of God in order to keep your tradition. He's saying this to the leadership of the Jewish people at the time. That's what I found to be the case. It's been the case, this is Jesus speaking 2,000 years ago. It's obvious from the Old Testament scripture that it was a case quite often with the people of God. And it most assuredly was the situation I found myself in as I was trying to find my place in the church then. Traditions, but not the word. Now, like I said, it, it's going to boil down to a choice between those two. All right. Not, not, not all traditions are, are bad. I mean, there's, you know, but traditions that lay aside the commandment of God, 
that replace the commandment of God, I'm not going to say that they're not good. I'm going to say that they're evil, right? Because they keep you from the commandment of God. I just want to read a few scriptures. I just want to read a few. Not These are not scriptures. These are things that I learned, all right, uh, about the Catholic Church's relationship with scripture. In the Council of Toulouse, which was in 1229 A.D., one of the things they did, they had a, a canon. Canon is, you know, one of the declarations. In Canon 14, they said, this is a Catholic Church. We prohibit also that the laity should be permitted to have the books of the Old or New Testament. Unless anyone from motive of devotion should wish to have a psalter or breviary for divine offices or the hours of the Blessed Virgin, but we most strictly forbid their having any translation of the books, the Bible. So the Catholic Church was, they were forbidding, it's not just that they weren't teaching it, they were forbidding the use of the Bible. And then in 1234, the Council of Tarragona in its second canon ruled, no one may possess the books of the Old and New Testaments in the Romance language. And if anyone possesses them, he must turn them over to the local bishop within eight days after the promulgation of this decree, so that they may be burned, lest he or a cleric or a layman be suspected until he is cleared of all suspicion. Now, the Romance language, they're saying, unless you had it in Latin, and remember the common people, very few, they, they couldn't read Latin. So you were allowed to have a Bible if you, could, you, know, if you couldn't read it. And then, of course, Martin Luther happened, and that led to the Catholic Church having the Council of Trent. And one of the things in the Catholic, in the Council of Trent, uh, was that during the Council of Trent, Pope Pius IV, they made a rule, rule number three, a list of forbidden books compiled and officially prohibited. Okay, these, this is one of the things that came out of the Council of Trent, books that could not be read by Catholics. Translations of books of the Old Testament may be allowed by the judgment of bishops for the use of learned and pious men only. These translations are to elucidate the Vulgate so that sacred scripture can be understood, but they are not to be considered a sacred text. Translations of the New Testament made by authors of the first sections in this index are not to be used at all, since too little usefulness and too much danger attends such reading. Too little useless. You don't, don't read the Bible. It's useless. Well, my ministry, and this our ministry is now over four decades, has been very simply to proclaim God's word powered by God's love. Because I believe in the word of God. I believe in the purity of the word of God. I believe that God uses the word to lead us in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. We're saved by the word. In the beginning, when you were saved, well, that's what the word of God says. For you have been born again, not of seed which is perishable, but imperishable. That is through the living and enduring word of God. 1 Peter 1.23. You're saved by the word. We're judged by the word at the end. If anyone hears my sayings, Jesus said, and does not keep them, I do not judge him. For I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. He who rejects me and does not receive my sayings has one who judges him. The word I spoke is what will judge him at the last day. For I did not speak on my own authority, initiative, but the Father himself who sent me has given me a commandment as to what to say and what to speak. The teaching, this teaching, is based purely and solely on the word of God. So if you don't believe the word, if you don't believe that the word is what it claims to be, then you're going to have difficulty with this. I guarantee that. But if, if that is the case, then you need to kind of sit and evaluate where you are. This, I said, it's a clear danger from within. All right, the danger that we're going to talk about. The reason it's clear is because we've been warned. From Jesus, as he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, 
Tell us, when will these things happen and what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? And Jesus answered and said to them, see to it that no one misleads you. For many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ and will mislead many. Matthew 24, 3 to 5. And then in verse 24, he goes on in verse 11 says, many false prophets will arise and will mislead many. Continues on a few verses later, say, then if anyone says to you, behold, here is the Christ or there he is, do not believe him. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and will show great signs and wonders, so as to mislead, if possible, even the elect. Behold, I have told you in advance. Christ was warning us 2,000 years ago. And from Peter, who the, the Catholic Church claims to be the first pope. But false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even the denying the, denying the master who bought them, bringing swift destruction upon themselves. Many will follow their sensuality, and because of them the way of the truth will be maligned, and in their greed they will exploit you with false words. Their judgment from long ago is not idle, and their destruction is not asleep. Second Peter 2, 1 and 3. The Apostle Paul. I mean, these are just some examples, and the Bible, the New Testament, is filled with them. The Spirit explicitly says that in latter times, some will fall away from the faith, paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons by means of the hypocrisy of liars, seared in their own conscience as with a branding iron, men who forbid marriage and advocate abstaining from foods which God has created to be gratefully shared in by those who believe and know the truth. 1 Timothy 4, 1 to 3. You know, the first time I read this, now remember, I was a Catholic. And then I was a Catholic before the Second Vatican Council. Men who forbid marriage. Well, the Catholic Church was saying, you can't serve God if you're married. Nuns couldn't be married. Priests couldn't be married. The brothers, you know, you can't serve God and be married. An advocate abstaining from food, which got, you know, I'd go to hell if I ate a hot dog on a Friday. That was the teaching of the Catholic Church. I said, how does that reconcile to the Word of God? And then Paul goes on in 2 Timothy and says, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires and will turn away their ears from the truth and will turn aside to myths. 2 Timothy 4, 3 and 4. I just want to read one more from Colossians chapter 2, verses 20 to 23. If you have died with Christ to the elementary principles of the world, why, as if you are living in the world, do you submit yourself to decrees such as do not handle, do not taste, do not touch, which all refer to things destined to perish with use in accordance with the commandments and teaching of men? These are matters which have, to be sure, the appearance of wisdom in self-made religion and self-abasement and severe treatment of the body but are of no value against fleshly indulgence. That's the danger from within. There's a danger from without. But Jesus said, you'll be hearing of wars and rumors of wars. See that you're not frightened, for those things must take place, but that is not yet the end. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And in various places there will be famines and earthquakes. But these things are all merely the beginnings of birth pangs. Then they will deliver you to tribulation and will kill you. And you will be hated by all nations because of my name. Matthew 24, 6 to 9. That's, a, that's, a, that's a, from the danger from without. But you know, Jesus said, which is the more dangerous? Jesus said, do not fear those who kill the body, but are unable to kill the soul. But rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Matthew 10, 28. Who's that? That's the Lord. You know, there's not much teaching in the body of Christ today about the fear of the Lord. But I will tell you something I have been saying for decades. Show me a man who fears the Lord, and I will show you a man who fears no man. You'll walk in the power and strength and confidence of Jesus Christ. Well, from within and from without, our fathers joined together for a one world religion. The ecumenical movement, I don't know if you're familiar with the term, 
the Second Vatican Council in, in, from 1962 to 1965, whose document on ecumenism, ecumenism made it possible for them to dialogue with non-Catholic denominations with a stated goal towards unity with their separated brethren. That was something brand new, right? I mean, prior to the Second Vatican Council, well, as a matter of fact, I mean, well, you, you ask a Catholic of an age, and they'll tell you, they had a belief, you, you know, if you were a Catholic and you walked into a Protestant church, you were going to hell. I mean, that's, it may sound silly to you, but I promise you, to those of us at the time, it was not silly at all. So consider the words of Pope Francis, his predecessor. Consider Pope Benedict the Sixteenth in an interview uh, in March of 2016. In the second half of the last century, it has been fully affirmed that the understanding that God cannot let go to perdition all the unbaptized and that even a purely natural happiness for them does not represent a real answer to the question of human existence. Sound a little confusing? Just hang with me a minute. If it is true that the great missionaries of the 16th century were still convinced that those who were not baptized are forever lost, and this explains their missionary commitment, in the Catholic Church, after the Second Vatican Council, that conviction was finally abandoned. What conviction was finally abandoned? That you would be lost if you didn't have faith, if you were not a Christian. Basically stating that you don't have to be a Catholic to be saved, to be part of the church and go to heaven. And according to the Italian newspaper, La Repubblica, a journalist, Eugenio Scalfari, who is a friend of Pope Francis, he quoted Francis as saying, they, those who die in sin, are not punished. Those who re repent obtain God's forgiveness and take their place among the ranks of those who contemplate him. But those who do not repent and cannot be forgiven disappear. A hell doesn't exist. The disappearance of sinning souls exists. That's what Francis said about There's no hell, right? So now that brings me to where I want to be about this, the danger that I see, because something, some things significant have happened in the last couple of years, all right? In 2014, now that's five years ago, Pope Francis made a, a historic visit to Israel. Some of you may remember this. So he first met with President Mahmoud Abbas of the Palestinian Authority, went there first. And then he went and met with President Sir Shimon Peres of Israel. And in a move towards peace, he invited both of them to come to the Vatican to pray together with him. To come to Vatican City for a time of prayer. So on June 8, 2014, those three men met in the Vatican Gardens and did in fact pray together for peace. Pope Francis said at that ceremony, it is my hope that this meeting will mark the beginning of a new journey where we seek the things that unite so as to overcome the things that divide. A Catholic, a Jew, and a Muslim, who did they pray to? They came to pray together. Who did they pray to? And what did they have to overcome that divides the people of those three religions? The thing, the Jews don't have Jesus Christ. They have not received him in general. The Muslims certainly do. He's a prophet, but he's not, not the one sent from the Father to save all mankind. In this grand gesture for peace, the one thing seemingly absent from all of the conversation and prayer, it's about peace, was the Prince of Peace. After all, is he not the thing that divides Muslims and Jews and, dare I say it, Roman Catholics? Unity is wonderful. Unity is commanded among the children of God. However, please know that the scripture says, I'm going to read from one place from 2 Corinthians chapter 6, starting in verse 14. This is the command of God. Do not be bound together with unbelievers. For what partnership have righteousness and lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? Or what harmony has Christ with Belial? Or what has a believer in common with an unbeliever? Or what agreement has the temple of God with idols? 
For we are the temple of the living God, just as God said, I will dwell in them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Therefore, come out from their midst and be separate, says the Lord, and do not touch what is unclean. And I will welcome you, and I will be a father to you, and you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. Now, that's what it's about being sons and daughters to the, our Father in heaven, the children of God, the Father with his sons and daughters. It's a family affair. It's absolutely a family affair. Jesus, when he was teaching, it says in Matthew 12, starting at verse 46, while he was still speaking to the crowds, behold, his mother and brothers were standing outside see seeking to speak to him. Someone said to him, Behold, your mother and brothers are standing outside seeking to speak to you. But Jesus answered the one who was telling him and said, Who is my mother and who are my brothers? And stretching out his hand towards his disciples, he said, Behold, my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my Father who is in heaven, he is my brother and sister and mother. That's how you get to be the family of God, by doing the will of the Father. Through the gift of his son, Christ Jesus. So speaking for all time to those who are in Christ, as it says in Romans 8, 1, Paul continues in that chapter to say, For you have not received the spirit of slavery, leading to fear again, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, by which we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are the children of God. Romans 8, 15 and 16. But to those who rejected his word, his own people, the Jews who rejected his word, Jesus said to them, If God were your father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and have come from God. For I have not even come on my own initiative, but he sent me. Why do you not understand what I'm saying? Is it because you cannot hear my word? You are of your father, the devil, and you want to do the desires of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. Whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature, for he is a liar by nature and the father of lies. John 8, 42 through 44. We are headed towards, Scripture says, a one-world church, all right? John on the island of Patmos, all right, Re received revelation from God by the, by the Lord, and he was shown. I'm going to read you some scriptures from chapter 13 of the book of Revelation. And the dragon stood on the sand of the seashore. Then I saw a beast coming up out of the sea, having ten horns and seven heads. And on his horns were ten diadems, and on his heads were blasphemous names. That's 13.1. He continues on in 3 and 4 and says, I saw one of his heads as if it had been slain, and his fatal wound was healed. Now listen, and the whole earth was amazed and followed after the beast. They worshipped the dragon because he gave his authority to the beast. And they worshiped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast, and who is able to wage war with him? Verse it says, The whole earth worshiped the Antichrist, the beast. It was also given to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. It goes on in verse 7 and 9 through 9. And authority over every tribe and people and tongue and nation was given to him. All who dwell on the earth will worship him. Everyone whose name has not been written down from the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb, who has been slain. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. The whole world will worship the beast. And then it goes on in verse 16 to say, And he causes all, the small and the great, and the rich and the poor, and the free, free men and slaves, to be given a mark on their right hand or on their forehead. Well, they finally get together. Now, that's an ecumenical movement. And by the way, I just want to say this. You know, a, a number of years ago, Alice and I were over, and we used to go, spend a lot of time in England as a base. And we go there for months, more than half a year at a time. And we were in the Manchester area in the north. 
And I was invited to go to a ecumenical prayer meeting. So Alice and I went with a, with a friend. And there were probably about 200 people there. And there were people from many, many different denominations. So at the end of it, the fellow that had invited us and brought us said, isn't, it, isn't this wonderful to see this unity, this, you know, the, the Catholics getting together with the Lutherans, with the Episcopalians, with this. And he goes on, he's naming all these different denominations. What unity? I said, you know what? I said, as long as there are Catholics and Lutherans and Episcopalians and I, there isn't any unity. There's only one name given by which men can be saved. And when we are all operating under that one name, the name of Jesus Christ, that's when there'll be unity. Unity is not different people coming together with different names. It's when we are all lost in Christ, when we have died and our lives are hidden with Christ in God. Okay. Now, all of that, believe it or not, was preliminary to get us to the place where I want to do the teaching. Right, because the teaching is about Pope Francis and the Grand Imam of Al Hazar Ahmad Atalib. He is the leader, the most. He is the spiritual leader of the Sunni Muslims, meeting with the spiritual leader, quote unquote, of the Roman Catholics. Now, the Sunnis represent. That's the greatest majority of all Muslims. I think it's. Yeah, I mean it's. Uh, the, the number is not quite sure because they can't uh, get people in some places to tell what kind of what they are, but it's like at least 85% of, of all Muslims are Sunni. And half of the people that call themselves Christian in the world are, are Roman Catholic, right? So just recently, just recently, I mean, this month, all right, an interfaith covenant was signed in the Middle East on Monday, February 4th. And the mainstream media in the United States has been almost entirely silent about it. I mean, there's been very, very little coverage about this. So Sheikh Ahmed al Tayyib is considered to be the most important imam in Sunni Islam, as I mentioned. it, And he arrived at the signing ceremony in Abu Dhabi with Pope Francis, hand in hand, as a symbol of interfaith brotherhood. This wasn't just a ceremony for Catholics and Muslims. According to a British news source, the signing of this covenant was done in front of a global audience of religious leaders from Christianity, Islam, Judaism, and other faiths. Okay? They made a covenant. That's an important word. So I want to just read some excerpts from this. And it was called the Document on Human Fraternity for World Peace and Living Together. This is available, and if you want, I mean, write to us at office at BibleTalk.com, and I will send you the links where you can go, because I got the document from the Vatican Library, right? This is not somebody's idea of what they said. This is the Vatican Library releasing this. This is a quote. It is a document that invites all persons who have faith in God and faith in human fraternity to unite and work together so that it may serve as a guide for future generations to advance a culture of mutual respect in the awareness of the great divine grace that makes all human beings, all human beings, brothers and sisters. It was on, in the name of God who has created all human beings equal in rights, duties and dignity, and who has called them to live together as brothers and sisters to fill the earth and make it known for the values of goodness, love and peace. There are two families in the world, two fathers. That's what I just, I just shared that with you, right? There is our father above, and there was a, another father. It is Satan from the beginning, the father of lies, all right? Those who have been born again, have been born again of a heavenly father of spirits, John 3, 3. Is what, and those who have chosen to follow the father of lies, John 8, 44, as I said, that's, he is. He's a liar by nature, the father of lies. He's the one that was a serpent in the, in the garden. Now listen the Lord does not want us to have unity with unbelievers. He wants us to have love for unbelievers. There is a gigantic difference in what we're supposed to be doing. Okay, We're not supposed to have unity with them. We can't. That's why what has a believer in common with an unbeliever? We are, however, supposed to have love for them. 
You figure out how you express that love for a non-believer. And it better include sharing the gospel. So the document goes on. It says, in the name of freedom that God has given to all human beings, creating them free and distinguishing them by this gift. All mankind is born or conceived in sin since the fall of man in the garden and is therefore a slave of sin. No, you didn't come into this world free. You came into this world as a slave. But it says in Romans 6, 17 and 18, but thanks be to God that though you were, bo you were slaves of sin, you became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which you were committed and having been freed from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. Okay? No Jesus, no freedom. That's just a fact. So if the Son makes you free, you'll be free indeed. That's John 8, 36. Freedom comes from Jesus Christ. In all of this talk of peace and freedom, there's no reference whatsoever to the Prince of Peace, Jesus Christ. But the statement goes on and says this, we who believe in God and in the final meeting with him and his judgment on the basis of our religion and moral responsibility. On our meeting with the Lord, now that's, that's the quote, right? On our meeting with the Lord on that day of the Lord, our judgment will not be based on how religious we were or how moral we were. How moral we live doesn't matter but by the fact that we accepted his amazing grace and love. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. And of course, we know what the free gift is. I mean, you know that, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. The gift of God is Jesus Christ. And that gift is made manifest in the proclamation of the word of the cross, which is the power of God. So while we are not brothers and sisters of Muslims, we are to love them. That love poured into our hearts by the Holy Spirit, as it says in Romans 5, 5, empowers us to bring the knowledge of Christ to Abu Dhabi, to the Vatican, and every other place that the Spirit of God leads us. But thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ and manifests through us the sweet aroma of the knowledge of him in every place. For we are a fragrance of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. 2 Corinthians 2, 14 to 15. Spiritually appraised, not sharing the love of God, not bringing the good news of the Father's gift, not speaking up can only be described as Hate speech. It's hate speech to not say this. Now the world will tell you that it's hate speech to do this. To go and tell somebody when they don't want to hear it about the love of God. It's hate speech not to tell them. And I would remember everybody, remind everybody that Jesus said this. Therefore, everyone who confesses me before men, I will also confess him before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I will also deny him before my Father who is in heaven. Matthew 10, 30, 32 to 33. Think about the fact that in this meeting, they never talked about Jesus. The Pope who claims to be the vicar of Christ never mentioned Christ. When Francis had the attention of the whole world, right, and he did, and the topic was peace, unity, and love, would that not have been a good time to speak about the Prince of Peace, who is love? But rather, they call, and this is what they said, and I'm going to end with this one. We call upon intellectuals, philosophers, religious figures, artists, media professionals, and men of women, and women of culture in every part of the world to rediscover the values of peace, justice, goodness, beauty, human fraternity, and coexistence in order to confirm, confirm the importance of these values as anchors of salvation for all and to promote them everywhere. There is not salvation for all that way. Hebrews 6, 17 and on says this, in the same way God, desiring even more 
to show the heirs of the promise the unchangeableness of his purpose interposed with an oath so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have taken refuge would have strong encouragement to take hold of the hope set before us. This hope we have as an anchor of the soul, a hope both sure and steadfast and one which enters within the well where Jesus has entered, entered as a forerunner for us, having become a high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. I'm going to end this session there, but I want you to see that where I'm going with this is to show you that this is the counterfeit. This is the imitation of God's plan, all right? Because God's plan, it's Jesus Christ. In him reside love. In him reside hope. In him is fraternity. Outside of Christ, none of that exists. So for the leaders of the Catholic Church and the leaders of the Sunni Muslims to come together and make these statements, it is the beginning of something very, very significant in our time. And that's significant. This is one of the things to bring about the one world church that is a precursor to the end days. So I have a little more to say about this, but we'll do that in our next session. I want to thank you for being with us and pray that you will pray about what you've heard. Test it according to the word, not according to what you have to say, but according to the word of God. So, Father, we just praise you and thank you for the gift of your son, Christ Jesus, who did for us what we could never do for ourselves, to make us united first and foremost with you, to make us one with you, to reconcile us to you, Father, that we might have the power then to have unity within the body of Christ. Lord, help us to take that love that you've poured into us and spread it abroad. Give us the boldness to proclaim your word and proclaim your love in every place that we go. I ask that, Father, in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Well, till next time.